So hello everybody, long time no see. Nice to see you all again. Um, I'm going to be giving you an overview of the Real Wolf project in terms of what it's for and what we aim to do and some technical details that we encountered on the way. So the presentation will be divided roughly into four sections. First of all, I'm going to be giving you some context, telling you about what is the problem we're aiming to solve? And in a nutshell, how do we aim to solve it? Then we jump to the end of the project and talk about what we deliver in terms of some uh, examples and uh, give you a more concrete idea of what it is. For section three, we peek behind the curtain and look at some technical details, talking about how the implementation that we built actually works. And then finally, we'll touch on some interesting expansion points for future work, setting up the sequel to the project. So if you, if you have uh, some, some really burning questions, please go ahead. But uh, unless, if they can wait for the end, that would also be fine. So we are in the context of network programming, specifically socket programming over the internet. Our observation is that this is a sorry state of affairs because we have this unfortunate gap between the level at which we want to describe and implement large multi-party distributed systems and what sockets provide in terms of what you can express and what you can build. So what, what you as the application developer are forced to do is to perform this non-trivial implementation process which expresses your high level thing in terms of these lower level granularities. This process is very error prone, it's very difficult, takes a lot of effort. You can think of it as noisy because you're introducing requirements that are not present in the original high level specification. And it's lossy because your intentions that you, you had in the high level version are obfuscated by these low level details. An unfortunate consequence of this is that things further down in the network stack don't have access to this protocol. They, they only see the intermediate representation. So this prevents um, middleware from being able to help you with enforcing the safety properties of your protocol. And it means that they have limited capabilities of optimizing the use of their resources. So in a nutshell, you can think of this project as addressing this problem. The idea is to build something that is an alternative to sockets that is oriented around the capturing and transport of these protocols all the way down the network stack. Concretely, we deliver two interrelated things. Number one is PDL, protocol description language, which is a variant of Rio, which everybody here is more or less familiar with or heard of maybe. And then number two is the implementation of connectors, which are this alternative to sockets that are configurable with these protocols to do things that you couldn't have done otherwise. So now we jump to the end of the project and we have a retrospective on what exactly we deliver in a bit more detail with some examples. Firstly, let's think of what is, what is our notion of a session. To us, a session is a particular run of a large coordinated system where components are sending each other messages to communicate. And we can lay out the behavior of this, the system over time. We, we discretize, discretize time into these abstract rounds. And in every round, we say that there is one interaction where the messages being sent over the network occur synchronously with one another. A central idea here is that these channels are the only way that these components communicate, but they really only see half of the channel at a time. So often we're thinking in terms of these channels as, the, as their ends. The components are acting on the sending or the receiving end of the channel. So often I'll think about sessions at this granularity as well. For example, this component C2 observes that no message is received in round zero or round one. 
Uh, furthermore, that these, these ports are owned uniquely by the components. So port ZI is owned by C2. Now connectors allow an application written in some native language to participate in sessions by taking the, assuming the role of a component in the session. We call this component the native component, suggesting that its behavior is implemented as native machine code or something like that. As far as practicalities go, the application gets this connector and it begins in the set phase. Some things you can do is you can set up communication channels. Like here in this picture, we have a channel being created and both of these ports being given to the native component. And to make this something that you can distribute over the network, you can participate in the creation of a channel cooperatively with some other connector using an IP address to, to rendezvous, so to speak. All of the connectors involved in the session end the round together when they complete this, uh, sorry, end the setup together when they complete this connect call and then communication begins. Here is a very concrete example of, of such a setup, just to give you a feel for what it might look like to the application developer. After instantiating your connector component, let's just ignore this config variable for now. The setup phase is spent initializing these ports. So two are initialized with a, a channel locally, and then another one is initialized over the transport layer using this IP address. Once communication begins, it's a bit like with sockets, you can send and receive messages. But to make this multi-party, you organize your, your message exchange operations into these rounds. Between the rounds, you prepare and reflect on the behavior of the round locally. This is something that you might be familiar with as a builder pattern, where incrementally you put together something and then you finalize it all at once. So here, the, the exchange of this set of messages through ports X, Y, and Z are prepared and then finalized with this connector sync, which is what actually realizes the communications. And afterwards, you can reflect on the message that you received. Something that you can do if, as a, a native component is you can express non-deterministic choice. We represent this by using this connector next batch delimiter. And you're, you're organizing your operations into these what we call batches. The idea being that you can express these things or those things, such that the runtime can decide for you which of the two occurs. After the fact, you can reflect on the return result of connector sync to figure out which of the two happened. Why would you want to do this? This allows you to write applications that are flexible to their, their role in the session. So in this example, you have, you have an application that doesn't care necessarily if it receives a message from Y. You can implement things without knowing the behavior of your counterparts. Here's another little example of two connectors coming together to form a session in which they communicate one round. They both set up half of the channel between them on the left called port P, on the right called port G. After connecting, they participate in a single round where the, the connector on the left offers the message high using a non-deterministic choice. And the one on the right demands some message but doesn't say what the contents are. The behavior that you'd observe at runtime is the transmission of the message high. So now we get to protocols. Protocol description language, which I'll just call PDL for short, allows you to express this kind of behavior in a, in a language purpose built for this. 
aside from that, it's meant to feel as close to C as possible. So you still have things like procedural control flow from top to bottom, types, variables, that kind of thing. One kind of component you can define is the primitive component. And these are essentially used to do communication work. Much like the native component, you organize groups of message exchange operations into these synchronous groups. So here we have some components participating in two rounds. In the first, receiving a message through port A and throwing it away, and then through port B in another round. Something that protocol components can do that natives cannot is it can express relationships between these messages. So here in the second round, this component is forwarding a message from port B through port C. This is not something you can do as a native because you have to prepare your messages first and then reflect on them second. Protocol components can express non-deterministic choice too. They do it slightly differently. You do it by specializing your behavior in terms of reflection on these values, these expressions whose values you don't know a priori. Here fires is evaluated to true or false. True if and only if some port B receives a message. Just by statically looking at this protocol description, you don't know whether or not B fires. The idea is that at runtime, B will either fire or it will not. The other kind of component you can define is the composite component, which allows you to do structural things, such as creating new channels. More importantly, you can create other components within a composite component, moving your ports into them. The idea being that composite components describe behavior that is the composition of other components. So in this example, you have some A, some uh, foo, taking in some port A, creating two new ports connected by channel B and C, with ports B and C, sorry, and then instantiating two new components, moving, them, moving their ports there. Connectors and protocols come together with the fact that native components can instantiate these protocol components too. So here we see the purpose of this config. You you're first have to initialize this protocol description structure, which is the parsed version of, of uh, all the components you intend to instantiate. And then during the setup phase, you're able to instantiate these components in much the same way that composites can by choosing an identifier for the component, and then passing in your ports. Here we see we pass in one port G, corresponding to this picture on the left. So what actually happens when you do this? The point is that once you've set up your, your session in this way, you rely on the runtime selecting interactions each round where the interactions are chosen, chosen to satisfy these requirements. First of all, you always know that all the components will, will agree on the values of ports and channels. So what, what messages are flying in the air? There will be no discrepancies. For example, these two are linked by a channel and they will always agree on which message is sent through the channel. Furthermore, the interaction that is eventually realized will not violate whatever constraints any component describes. In the case of natives, you know that the interaction will always correspond to one of the batches you've described. In this particular case, what this native is expressing is the sending of the message hi or hey. And then we can see that these two outcomes would be permitted and these two will not. In the case of protocol components, it's a bit more subtle. The idea is that the interaction will result in the protocol state, the, sorry, the component state being updated to reflect one path through the synchronous block. So in a sense, it, it, it allows anything that corresponds to any of the paths through. 
So here is an example of a component with two ports that says that if some message is received at port A, it forwards it to port B, and then asserts that the message had length two. These two cases would be allowed. The contents of the message are not checked, but if their lengths are two, everything's fine. This case on the right wouldn't be allowed because there's no way to explain it with a path through the component. It's not possible for there to be a message sent at B if A didn't receive a message. And this, the second one would also not be allowed, despite the fact that the, the component would get up to here, the assertion would fail. And so this wouldn't be allowed either. So what is the point of all this? The idea of, of this setup of components and protocols and connectors is that you as the application programmer can set up the session environment that you want by instantiating the ports and components and, and kicking them off. And then henceforth, concentrate only on sending and receiving messages on, the, on your local ports and trusting that the connector will make sure that if there are communications that can be realized, sensible communications without errors, they will be facilitated such that everybody is happy. So now let's, let's stop and take a look behind the curtain. How exactly does this implementation work? How does it find and reason about these interactions such that everybody's happy? Perhaps this has already occurred to you, but this problem that we've described presented to the runtime is an instance of the distributed constraint satisfaction problem where the solution, namely the thing that the runtime attempts to identify and realize is what is the interaction that occurs this round? And then how do the components, how are their states updated to reflect it? And the constraints are expressed by these protocols, uh, by the, the protocol of the session or the, that of the components. In this little example on the right, this component X says, oh, it's, it wants to receive some message at port W and the, where the first character is the ASCII capital H. A concrete solution to this little example might be this. Another idea is that all of the components are happy with what they see. I want to walk you from what I would imagine to be the, the most intuitive, naive implementation of such a solver toward what is actually implemented so that you can understand what we've built and so I can justify the decisions we've made. Most straightforward thing one can do is start by just enumerating all the conceivable solutions. And you don't know there is a solution yet, so we call them the candidates. Consider all the candidates, checking whether there are solutions and settling on perhaps the first one that you find. That is, that's quite conceivable, right? Well, firstly, how does one go about checking whether a candidate is a solution? Recall that the interaction is only satisfactory if it satisfies, I'll say, every component in the session. We could think of this in a case-by-case -case basis. So for native components, this is pretty simple. Given a candidate solution, we just have to check if the things it observes at its ports correspond with exactly, well, correspond with one batch. In this case, this native component says, I want to send the message high, which is consistent with this solution, with this candidate, sorry. In the case of protocol components, now that you have the interaction spelled out concretely, it suffices to start at the top of the synchronous block and walk through seeing what path you, you draw. And if you get to the end of the synchronous block, without encountering any errors or observing anything inconsistent with the solution, this is this satisfies the component. Okay, very well, but how, how do we go about distributing this task over the network? We have multiple connectors, 
how does that work in this distributed environment? So to begin, we introduce the notion of, of locality and management. So let's say we partition the set of components over the set of connectors, and I'll call the connector manage, we'll, I'll say the connector manages the set of, of components. And we'll just have the, the checking of these solutions performed in parallel by these connectors. So here is the same solution checked piecemeal by the connectors. The next thing we have to do is we have to aggregate information distributed over the, net, over the network. So what we do is we introduce the solution tree, which is an overlay structure, an overlay network, where uh, all of the connectors and components of the session are organized into a hierarchy, such that information travels from the leaves, these components, toward some connector who is the root of the tree, which I will call the leader. So per component, we can, re we can enumerate the set of candidate solutions and pass up the tree the ones that this component accepts. These internal nodes kind of have a global view of the subtree uh, that, that they are the root of, if that makes sense. What emerges is this filtering of solutions down the tree from the leaves all the way down to the root. And at the end of the day, the connector that is the leader has, uh, can reason about which candidates all of the session's components have accepted and it can perform the decision. With a single leader, we know that there will be consensus. Only one decision will occur and this can be broadcasted such that everybody observes the same solution. Fine, this is functional, but it's still perhaps a bit infeasible because you can imagine that every candidate solution that I've depicted here as a letter would spell out the entire um, assignment space of, of port variables to messages. Messages can be very large. There can be very many of them. And so you'll get very large candidates, but you'll also get very many candidates, particularly at the leaves of this tree. So how do, we, how do we approach this problem? We can structure the search through candidates by looking at them in aggregate, rather than looking at, I will, I'll say, concrete particular candidates. We think in terms of predicates. We have the structure that describes essentially a set of candidate solutions, and we just reason at this granularity. The idea is that at the leaves of this tree, these predicates, these predicates can include many candidates because you're only reasoning about a few ports at a time. I don't want to specifically describe how these predicates are realized in the implementation. I just want to sketch an idea. In this example, we have two ports in the session P and Q. But since this, com this uh, component here doesn't reason about Q, all the candidates it generates will include any, any and all assignments to the messages traveling through port Q. Only higher up in the tree, or sorry, lower down in the tree, closer to the root, will the partial information from, can, from predicates coming this way and predicates coming that way be put together, ultimately coming, coming up with a concrete solution such as this. The intuition with the structure of these predicates is that because ports are spread out all over the session, per port, very few components will be reasoning about their value. So these, by thinking about these constraints sparsely, the candidates can be very terse, but can still represent many, sorry, the predicates can be very terse and thereby represent many candidates in aggregate. So, so far I've spent a lot of time talking about given candidates, how do they ultimately become solutions? So we, we have a relatively good understanding of what's going on with the inner nodes of this tree. They're aggregating information. But what are the leaves doing? How do the leaves drive the search for candidates to begin with? So far, we've been thinking, uh, coming from the native, the, sorry, the naive implementation, thinking of the steps 
of enumerating candidates and checking candidates as two distinct steps. But we have a lot of information at our disposal. For every protocol component, we've got the protocol. We know how it's going to behave. And for native components, we have these batches. We have a lot of information. We know what they're going to do. So we instead perform these two steps together. Concretely, in the case of native components, we're essentially told precisely which candidates lead to satisfactory solutions for this component. Namely, per batch, we generate a candidate. What's quite nice is that we get something that's very intuitive. Without knowing the rest of the session, this is what the candidate would look like, reasoning only about the ports local to this component. In the case of protocol components, we do something a bit more subtle, namely, we speculatively execute the paths this protocol component could walk through its synchronous block in a safe encapsulated environment. So starting at the top of the block in the state it is currently in, we explore unfolding all the various branches where there are any whenever you encounter unknown information. To make this clear, here is a, a little example of a component that encounters one branch here in the beginning where it has to speculate. Well, does a message, is a message sent through port P, yes or no? It splits into two. The left branch reaches the end of the block straight away, and then the predicate is already known. You have a concrete value known for, for P. In the other case, you know that you will send a message, and then you also know what, the, what is the value of P, namely the zero byte message, empty, empty message. As long as this, this path reaches the end of the synchronous block, you get a predicate. So it's kind of clear how this might work for a component that doesn't depend on any other components, but things get a bit more difficult when they do. On the right, we see a different component who receives messages from somebody else. So its, it's behavior depends on somebody causally upstream, let's say. One thing you could do is you could have the, these candidate solutions either attempting to encode the relationships between G and its environment, or at this moment that you hit this point where the protocol component is speculating about the contents of the message, you could enumerate them. You could branch into thousands or millions of different branches, each with different concrete values of the message. But this, both of these solutions are not ideal. So instead what we do is that we, we have putters and getters like this in these situations cooperate with one another. The speculation plays out the round, including the communications between components. So in this particular example, what you'd see is the speculation of this left component, which doesn't depend on anything, leaking some, inf some speculative information to its counterpart through this channel saying, hey, this is a message I could potentially send you. And that informs this component of what else could happen next, and then creating a branch that continues to the end of the synchronous block. At the end of the day, you would get exactly what we'd expect, namely, both components find, oh, given the session environment, these are the things that I would encounter. These are the ways I could finish the block. The idea of this approach, namely letting the components communicate with each other while they're speculating, is that instead of, of the cost of speculation scaling with the, the number of satisfactory values of messages, which is potentially very large, Instead, we just scale with the number of paths through the, through the components, which in practice tend to be way smaller. In this case, there are essentially two paths. As a bonus, this speculation of these components that are dependent on other things is essentially lazy. If we're dependent on, inf on information that's not available yet, we postpone this, the continued speculation until that information becomes available. So if you put all this together, in a nutshell, this is how the implementation works. 
two cooperating distributed processes are trying to reason about what interactions will satisfy all of these components such that their view of the session is consistent, stays consistent. On the one hand, you have something that, that the user might even expect. You're playing out what could happen in the, in the, in the session in the next round. Uh, components are updating their states and so on. And on the other hand, you've got this solution search and information aggregation process that is distributed over the session, reasoning about, well, what do we know so far until we get to a point where the leader of the session can conclude, okay, this interaction would make everybody happy and I choose to decide on it and thereby consensus is trivial because we always we just allow one connector in in particular to make this decision and announce it to the other connectors so that gives you an idea of of the essence of the implementation how it does its main thing namely communicate let's talk about some some things you can do with connectors that you cannot do with sockets Sometimes, whether you like it or not, you can describe sessions and interact uh, sessions where the next interaction is very, very difficult to compute. Now, this is quite easy to do because by design, you don't, you're not supposed to be reasoning about the entirety of your session at a time. As the application developer, the whole idea is that you can concentrate on your local view and trust that the connector will take care of the rest. Now, it's very difficult to avoid being able to shoot yourself in the foot by describing hard problems. So just like, just like um, as is the, the paradigm in network programming sometimes, we use timeouts as an escape hatch to avoid the system from starving. The idea is that as the application, uh, you can say, I'm willing to spend this amount of time searching for the next interaction, but no more. And this is taken into account when the runtime is working on discovering the next interaction. If it's taking too long to find the next um, interaction to realize, your native will send a timeout request all the way up the tree, and it's essentially racing the solution to the round. In this way, the round will end either when you found an interaction or when the least patient native has timed out, if that makes sense. A nice property of this is that if you're impatient, you can use this to avoid relinquishing your control such that you can say, okay, guys, that's enough time wasted on this interaction. Let's try something else. All the applications can reflect on that and say, fine, let's, let's try this other thing. But also, very importantly, even in the event of a timeout, the session is kept in a consistent state. All of the speculation that occurred during the round doesn't affect the state that you observe when it times out. It rolls back to the beginning of the round, so to speak, such that you can try again. The other thing I wanted to point out is something that is facilitated by having access to these protocols during the setup phase. The idea is that since we're ultimately concerned in what kind of communication behavior is exposed to the applications, we have some freedom in messing with the internals of the connector without observing, sorry, without affecting what they can observe, but at the same time, changing the runtime behavior of the session. In a nutshell, we can transform the internals of the session to that of another session with identical behavior, but perhaps can be computed more quickly. To give you some examples of some kind of session transformations that we explored and performed some benchmarking with, if the session consists of chains of idempotent components that where it's, it suffices to have just one, the session can be transformed to remove and rewire the channels. Here, for example, is a test where long chains of synchronous channels are bouncing messages back to the native. 
during session transformation, you can recognize this pattern and say, fine, before we begin, let's remove these synchronous components and uh, stitch them together to shorten the loop. Seen in this graph here, you'll see the cost of facilitating one synchronous round for when the chain is n length, the session transformation effectively moves you left in the graph, closer to zero. Another thing that is particularly useful when you're on a network with non-trivial latency is you could increase the locality between the components performing the work. So perhaps you have two separate connectors which have very little knowledge of one another describing communications between them sometimes. It might be fruitful to move this protocol component over the network using a session transformation. The behavior is the same at the end of the day, but because um, these two components are closer together, this speculation process and everything like that becomes a lot faster because it's in shared memory. A slightly more subtle optimization is something like this. Perhaps you've got a native uh, on the left and it's in, on one process and then you've got a native on the right on its own process where the, the one receiving messages is routing things through some filtering component. You can transform the session to push the filter closer to its source such that the messages are filtered out before traversing the network. You can see here that depending on the circumstance, such as the size of the, of the message, this can have a profound impact on how much traffic there is over the network, obviously, and how quickly you can find the solution to the round. I want to point out that at the end of the day, the, the, the applications are not aware that this change has been performed. There's another interesting case where once the session begins, you can identify clusters of components that behave in a certain way, such that they can be replaced by a cluster of simpler components. Here, for example, we see uh, messages being routed that are routed through one of two branches non-deterministically and then merged once again. Whether or not the message goes left or right is not important to the native because it can't observe the difference anyway. So you can recognize this pattern and replace it with a component that doesn't bother speculating about left or right. Both in Rio and in, and in PDL, it's sometimes useful to keep the number of primitive components small and define composite components that do work in terms of the primitives. A, a canonical connector from, from the realm of Rio is the sequencer, which sends signal messages through ports A, B, and C in, a, in sequence one per round. Typically, this is expressed in terms of other components, such as the FIFO components and the simpler things like that. But it turns out that in some cases, it's much more efficient to, to actually just create a specialized implementation in a primitive. As, as is the case in, in Rio, you can often express the same behavior in different ways. So we can recognize the case of a composite primitive, perhaps inserted by the application developer because it's intuitive or it keeps the number of primitives low, but we can swap it out during the setup phase for this version, which just runs more efficiently. So that is an overview of the state of things as it is now. Let's take a look at the things that we could do in the sequel to the project. Some of these developments have to do with making PDL more expressive or being able to express new kinds of protocols uh, and new kinds of sessions. Let's take a look at some of those. One of the first developments that we considered is the relaxation of our notion of synchrony. So currently, if you recall what we saw previously, the aim of the game is to identify an interaction that progresses every component one synchronous block into the future. This could be relaxed, saying that, fine, we're allowed to progress each component any number of synchronous blocks into the future, 
the effect is that you're taking power away from the components to control the granularity of these interactions. And you're giving power to the runtime to control which components it includes in the interaction. So the advantage of making this change is that if you have a component that describes behavior that is holding up the session, the runtime can, can essentially cut them out and find solutions that avoid them doing that. The same components then also become more flexible. So for example, here we have an example of some component foo that expresses that it wants to receive two messages in sequence. With this change, these could be fused into a single round and the component would be none the wiser. The downside of this change is that you, you need a new way of giving components a way to ensure that they do not starve. You could have some degenerate case where some component is always left frozen, never making any progress. We need to get around that first. Another future change would be very, which would be very useful is the relaxation of our notion of what is a session. Namely, it would be useful to be able to take this solution tree while communication has already begun and split it such that components can leave, components can join, two existing sessions can be fused into one, that kind of thing. Achieving this kind of thing is, is quite conceivable. You'd have to simply explore ways of reconfiguring the solution tree safely. It also would make things more robust to failures. For example, in this, in this session here, if, if one of our nodes crashes, you can envision the solution tree being reconfigured around the dead node. This is a separate um, future direction that is not necessarily mutually exclusive with the idea of relaxing synchrony, but it kind of it aims to achieve the same thing in a different way. Namely, it relaxes the, the requirement that up to one message is sent through a port per round. You could conceive of a, set, a system where something like this is permitted, namely sending one message and then sending another through the same port synchronously. This is also conceivable. You just have to change the way the implementation reasons about its, its predicates and how it structures its, its interactions and these, the speculation process. Instead of reasoning about whether or not a port fires, it becomes necessary to count how many times it fires and to index these messages and that kind of thing. But this enables all new kinds of, of behavior that group more things into one round. Another promising future direction is the, the I either get a message or I do not. And it appears that either of the two options ends the round successfully. Now this, the result of the round is remembered in this variable. And then it turns out in round two, you enforce one, one branch in particular. So here we're essentially saying in round two, you find out what you should have done in round one. If you had further look ahead, you could anticipate these kinds of problems and it would prohibit the consideration of the, the branch that turns out to be bad in the future. Other kinds of future work are perhaps a bit more, a bit more short-sighted and they have to do with just uh, taking advantage of some findings of the benchmarking work, making changes to the implementation such that it does its work more efficiently. The first of, of all of these, which is arguably the most interesting, is just making the session transformation procedure a lot more robust. In its current form, it's very, it's very limited, it's very particular, 
And it, it doesn't have a way of dealing with user-defined protocols. It just, you'd have to optimize around them because it cannot reason about them very much. In future, what would be, the, what would be ideal is a session transformation procedure that, that does something very structural. It, reasoning about the properties of, compo of uh, protocols, even ones that are defined by the user at the last minute. For example, you could think of something in the direction of, of um, matching and, and term rewriting or this, this patch rewriting business where you're looking for patterns in the session's components and rewriting them piecewise. During the development, because there's a lot of speculation going on where one component might be branching out to several, have several states at the same time, it became fruitful to introduce a way for these branches to share messages very, very efficiently. So if you're sending a thousand kilobyte message through the network and you're speculating what, about what you do next, you don't have to copy these thousand bytes a hundred times. This works very well in local memory, but it, it doesn't translate across the network. So in future, we could essentially generalize, uh, generalize this optimization by introducing identifiers for messages such that you can decouple the movement of messages from the movement of messages contents, if that makes sense. This would be particularly useful in the case where you have components that are routing messages but never actually inspecting their contents, which does actually happen quite a lot. For example, currently, if you send a message across the network and back, the contents are sent as well, just in case the recipient wants to reflect on them. With this optimization, you could send the identifier ahead, racing with the contents of the message. So if, if the identifier suffices to perform the speculative work, it doesn't matter if the other message gets lost or takes long. This future direction is essentially already guaranteed because it is set up for the SQL and it is pushing connectors a bit deeper into the, into the uh, operating system. Currently, the interface between the application, sorry, between user mode and kernel mode is between connectors and the transport layer. So the connector runtime is, is making system calls to send and receive these control messages. With this future direction where the connectors are pushed a bit deeper into the kernel, you could have closer cooperation between the transport layer and these sessions. And other operating system tasks can take advantage of having these protocol descriptions. <coughs> Finally, Currently, the, the distributed control messages are being transported over TCP. That is to say, um, messages are being corralled into TCP segments and then sent over that way. The reason for this is it simplifies the implementation of these control algorithms that the connector uses to make sense of the implementation, uh, to make sense of the interaction. The reason for this is because TCP provides very useful things, namely, you can be assured of delivery, you can be assured of ordering, that kind of thing. Often, these requirements are really not necessary. Namely, during speculation, um, when sending messages through a channel, it's completely overkill for different concurrent branches of a speculation to order these messages. It would be perfectly fine for them to race one another over the network. So the idea is that a future direction might invest the effort in changing the implementation such that this TCP-like ordering and delivery is only used when absolutely necessary. Furthermore, you could make this, these control algorithms sensitive to the protocol. Namely, if you have a speculation which has to send many messages and you're retransmitting lost messages to ensure that they are delivered, you could prioritize system resources to branches that you deem more likely to succeed, things like that. That's currently not possible. And that is it. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, here's my collage slide as is tradition. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. I've got a little link to jump to things.